Welcome to the show. We hope you have a blast. Thanks for making time for the Dealer Talk Podcast. Another business leader, here's a penny for your thoughts. This ain't a regular conversation, baby. This that Dealer Talk, yeah. What up? Welcome to another episode of the Dealer Talk Podcast. This is your host, Herb Anderson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Today, we have none other than Mr. Tyler Champagne on the program, creator of the awesome awesome series heated seats what's up tyler how are you man hey herb i'm great how are you i'm doing good buddy i'm super stoked to have you on the show i love what you're doing with uh uh you know your approach to content creation man definitely want to talk to you more about that um so welcome dude yeah thanks appreciate you having me yeah it's uh you know i i've taken a little bit of a different approach to uh content creation for the automotive industry i'd say so uh I guess it sort of makes me stand out a little bit, whether that's good or bad. That's, uh, I guess that's up to you. <laughs> While you're here, so I like it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> good point. Um, uh, so I, I kick things off with, uh, with the background. So tell us about you, man. Yeah. So, uh, you know, born and raised around uh, Toronto, Canada, sort of in smaller towns outside of that area. I uh, got into the car biz when I was, I'm going to say 18 was my first job. I was a uh, lot manager, um, which means a lot attendant. And I took it <laughs> very seriously. So I added man. Um, if they allowed me, I would have put, you know, PhD of moving cars or something like that. Um, and then I went to school actually for, uh, for a couple of years for a sport management program and then got out of that after a couple of years and actually went to school in toronto at humber college for comedy writing and performance believe it or not so if you're thinking that's a real program that's exactly what my mom <laughs> said so um did that for two years uh graduated with honors i guess if you could call that uh, from that from that school which was i mean it was it was a blast i learned a lot and then I wasn't really sure what to do after that. You know, I was doing a, quite a bit of stand-up comedy around the city and around uh, Southern Ontario, where I'm from, with some friends and stuff. We were doing shows, and and you know, that uh, wasn't exactly paying the bills. So, you know, I, I figured, you know, what what do I like? What are my passions? And my uh, my mom suggested getting into car sales. She's like, you know, you like you love cars. You've always loved cars and motorized vehicles. So. And you like talking to people, you know, you do stand up comedy and you write comedy and stuff. So why not, you know, sort of combine your love for talking to people with and cars and get into the auto industry. So I applied for a job and that was in summer of 2014. And I've been involved in the uh, in the sales side of the car biz ever since. Right on, man. Very, very interesting journey for sure. I, I want to talk about the the the. Uh, um you know, pre automotive industry a little bit, because I think it, it ties into kind of what you're doing right now. So you always had a passion for, for performing and the arts, so to speak. Yeah. But what the funny thing is, is I never took, uh, you know, a, a drama course in, in high school. I never did any of that. The first, um, real exposure I had to, I mean, I was always a fan of, of stand up comedy and watching stand up comedy. And I watched the tonight show with Jay Leno when I was, you know, single digits in age with my with my parents. And, you know, I always thought that that stuff was great and hilarious. And then in uh, I did a couple of plays, actually, with a good friend of mine in high school that he wrote. He thought that I you know, was funny enough and was a good enough actor, I guess, to uh, <laughs> to be in in these in these plays that he wrote. And then for for, you know, senior year high school, grade 12 at my high school, every uh, student who's graduating has to do a senior speech every year. It's, you know, five to seven minutes about a topic that you're passionate about. You know, some people do it about family. Some people do it about the sports they were involved in. Um, and I went to our English teacher and I said, can I do stand up comedy? And they were like, uh, no one's ever done that before or even asked. But, you know, obviously they have to approve all of the stuff, just like they do with the speeches. It has to be read through. It's a high school, not a prison. <laughs> um, and they said, yeah, go for it. So that was my first ever exposure to actually doing stand-up comedy myself was in my senior speech in, in high school. 
and it was actually in a chapel or a church, if you will, um, which is hilarious looking back. I mean, I was, you know, performing this material that I had written and I had like beautiful stained glass windows behind me. I mean, it was a real sort of experience. Um, and I wish there was video of it, um, but unfortunately there, there isn't. No one, not everyone had a camera phone back in, uh, you know, 2009. Yeah, <laughs> Black, the Blackberry days, right? <laughs> yeah, or Motorola. Uh, uh, motor, the motor razor. Laser, I mean, everyone, yeah, yeah. At least in my high school. <laughs> so that was uh, that was the, the the peak of technology for me, at least. For sure, oh, dude. So so how how transferable has that been for you in the automotive industry? Because it seems like a lot of that would be perfect, especially in a in a in a sales role, right? I mean, um, to be able to. Um, you know, express yourself and, and, and you know, talk to people and, and do all these things. Yeah, you know, th uh, the thinking on your feet thing is definitely something that helps. You know, there's uh, there's nothing that, that makes you grow as a thinker faster than, you know, being on stage in front of 300 people and it's not going the way you planned it. Right. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've bombed in front of hundreds of people uh so you know what's a couple of obstacles with a family who's looking at a new car right that's how that's how i kind of looked at it as, as not a scary experience you know oh, oh they're gonna say no you're not booing me you're not throwing stuff at me this this is going pretty well you know <laughs> so like i said that that experience but was but was funny actually is is um I, I still remember to this day the first car i ever sold was probably a month or two into the business um, let's be honest, it may have been kind of handed to me by, uh, you know, management, but <laughs> it, it got my feet wet, right? And I remember the guy uh, at the end, uh, it was an older couple, and he said to me, he goes, because we'd had a conversation about what I did, and he goes, you need to let loose a little bit. Like, you said you're a comedian, and I didn't really see that side of you at all during this whole transaction, and it was over a wow. few weeks. Um, you know, I guess I was, you know, maybe being a little bit over conservative or, or what, what have you. Um, but yeah, that was the first car I ever sold. The guy goes, yeah, you know, loosen up a little dude. Come on. This is, you know, this isn't to be taken too seriously. So, <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it, they say that, right. It's supposed to be fun, but when it's, yeah. when you're in the seat and then the pressure's on, it's, it's a different thing, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. So, um, so heated seats, man. Where did that? I love the approach, man. It's it's a, <laughs> it's a very interesting take on what a lot of us are doing out there. Um, just curious, when you when you had this idea, did you did you kind of mull it over for a little bit and were like debating it, or you were like, I'm you know I'm I'm doing this thing? Yeah, you know there was there was a lot of prep that that kind of went into it. Um, I would say probably actual you know from the day i decided this is what it's called to when i actually launched it was probably between four and six months somewhere in that range but i'd always kind of wanted to do something like this for years you know i like like a lot of people in the car biz you know i, I was always a fan of top gear um i was always mm -hmm. a fan of, of those types of shows where it was you know car related but you really got to know the people in it and and the characters and it felt like watching a, a reality show almost more than like a car review. I mean, you're learning about the cars, sure. but it's more than that, right? I always, you know, I, I had conversations with, you know, my friends in, in comedy school of who are also into cars, like, why can't we do like a Canadian version of that? And, you know, obviously at the time, you know, when we were getting paid in chicken wings and ginger ale, we didn't exactly have the budget. Um, but, you know, it was, it was something that I always kind of wanted to do. I, I, when I started working in, in the auto industry, I, I wasn't able to do stand up as much. You know, I, I wouldn't consider myself a, you know, a stand up comic anymore. I think that does a bit of a disservice to, you know, all my friends who are still out there grinding it out. But, um, you know, I'm the, I guess the funny car guy. Um, and, and like I said, it was, uh, I, I hadn't been able to do stand up as much. So I wanted to figure out a way to, to, to put this passion for cars together with, um, you know, my ability to write uh, write comedy and perform comedy and i came up with a with with the name heated seats i thought it was you know sort of a double entendre a little bit of a play on words because the goal was always to have a podcast i just didn't know how to get there yet hmm. and i figured you know if i have guests on it you know there's going to be seats and they might get heated 
So it was, you know, why don't I call it this? It's car related, it's comedy related. I uh, came up with that title and then it was, uh, yeah, I launched it, I believe it was end of March of 2020. So we're almost coming up on a year actually since yeah. the web series has been live. Yeah, no, man. I, I, again, I know I've said it already multiple times here, but I, I love it. I think it's, I think it's a refreshing way to look at the industry. You know what I mean? There, there is a lot of comedy in it. If you, you know, if you're looking at, the, if you're looking at it the right way, um, just nobody has ever really kind of put that those two together. So I think, <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. A hundred percent, especially you know the, like I said, you know the top gear stuff. That's not really that's car related and it's comedy, but it's not specifically auto industry right. related right yeah. you know like i i've done i've done videos uh you know video episodes about you know trade-ins and that kind of stuff that's kind of inside and you know most people can relate to it but yeah i've gotten some great feedback from people in the industry who who are like you know wow man this is i haven't really seen this take on it before um because again there's so much if you've ever worked in a dealership i mean the amount of stuff that goes on right is wild i don't I can't remember. I mean, maybe there's been one or two in, in history, you know, sort of a sitcom based in a car dealership. But, you know, my 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 managers and some of my sales team always say, you know, we could have a reality show here and it would be good. It, it would there would be hundreds of hours of footage of stuff uh, to try to cram into into an episode. So that, that maybe was a little bit of the inspiration, too. You know, why don't why don't I bring this? Because again, you know, as as we can we can admit, we, you know, look ourselves in the mirror in the auto industry. We're a little behind when it comes to, you know, technology and that type of thing. Is and you know, there's sort of that stuffy sort right. of aura, you know, the, the the used car manager in the beige suit type of aura about the business. <laughs> but why can't we have fun with it? You know, why can't we we you know make fun of ourselves and laugh at ourselves? It's you know, it's just like any other business. How many other workplace comedies are there? Um, that you know took off and you know like even even about an industry that's not even interesting like the office you know about a paper supply company right yeah looking at that on the surface a, a sitcom or i guess it was more of a reality comedy type of thing about a paper company you'd go well, where's the funny in that but again give the right people in good writing there's a lot uh, a lot there yeah well there's characters man within the dealership i think that anybody that's to your point anybody that's worked at the dealership can identify certain people that you'd be like dude this would be hey, this is a hit show right now 100 percent. there's you know there's the there's you know eat, every dealership has you know probably the the old veteran who you know struggles with technology i i, I actually yeah. had him uh his name is is joe he's one of our longest uh tenured reps and one of our top sellers every month i had him in in uh, one of the videos i think it was the year in review video i did um where he was you know struggling to get onto a zoom call and the camera's at the bottom of his chin and he has no idea what's going on i mean i'm sure every dealership has that that right. guy or gal who's you know not exactly doing you know facetime calls with customers and maybe they have you know Twelve thousand unread emails, which gives me more anxiety than anything I could imagine. But you know, there's like like you said, there's a ton of characters in the business and and, and in the dealership. So I thought let's uh, let's do something a little different and bring some comedy to it. So right now, currently, what what do you, are you working at a dealership? Are you consulting? Like what are, what what do you do? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm actually a sales manager at a at a Chevy Buick GMC store um, in Toronto. Which again, that's that's. That's my career that I absolutely love. I mean, it's it's. I'm pretty thankful that I'm in a in the business. You know, I, got, I like I said in the beginning, I kind of got into it on a whim. It was like, you know, why don't I try this? Um, so I, I was in sales for two years before I was promoted to assistant sales manager, and then two years after that, um, the store I'm at now amalgamated with the store I was at and another store to to sort of bring three teams together, and I was promoted to sales manager at that store and that's where I've been for a couple of years now. So this is, you know, this is a side project that I, I have a lot of fun with, um, but I'm still, you know, very passionate about what I do at the dealership because again, it's all, it's all intertwined. It's all the stories that I get, the stories that I talk about on my podcast or on in the videos is all stuff that I've seen at the dealership. Right. right. So, yeah, no, I've definitely, I've, I've definitely seen the, that, that connection, which I really like to, to what you said earlier too, because, of the stigma and things like that in, in the in the business, I think it's good to to kind of make light of it a little bit. Not to say that it is it isn't a serious business; it definitely is. But man, there's just a lot of crazy that happens within it, right? Yeah, I'm, and you know, it's it's long hours too. You know, I mean, you're spending a, a lot of times. You're spending, you know, it's a little 
different now with uh, with COVID going on and, you know, the shortened hours and, you know, government lockdowns and stay at home orders and all that stuff. But, you know, when you're working, you know, bell to bell, as the, as the vets say, and you're there from 830 to nine o'clock at night, you're spending a lot more time at the dealership than you are with your own family sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. the, the, you never really stop working. You know, you're answering leads at home. You're following up with customers when you're in the car. It's you spend a lot of time there. So why not, you know, have some level of enjoyment with it and poke a little fun. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. And, and, and you know, I, it brings up a question that I wanted to ask you, especially for the, for the people that are maybe taking ops and are thinking about, or uh, toying with the idea of, of doing something on, uh, you know, as far as creating content, social media and whatnot. Do, have these efforts paid out any sort of dividends? And by that, I don't mean sales particularly, but maybe it's um, leads or whatever um, for consumers, right? Because your content is geared more towards people in the industry, right? Dealerships and that sort of thing. Yeah. But, you know, it's out there, right? So uh, uh, um, a... Somebody that's maybe in the in the in market to buy a car may stumble upon a piece of your content. Have you seen that pay off in some way, shape, or form? I definitely had people reach out. You know, I've had people say, "You know, you work at a dealership. I'm looking for this vehicle." Um, so I've definitely had a few of those. And then also for our dealership specifically, um, I've I've done some content for them. You know, that's more product related. You know, doing a kind of a you know a short 30 second or 20 second uh, commercial if you will that we're putting on excuse me that we're putting on instagram reels right that's you know one of the reasons my my account kind of blew up in the last three months was because of instagram reels it's a very similar algorithm to TikTok, right so it can be seen by a ton of people that aren't necessarily following you because as, as you know and as anyone who's you know a content creator and that type of stuff it's really hard to grow um a following when you're just like you know, starting an Instagram account and you start posting stuff. But Reels is, like I said, a lot like TikTok. It's it's getting seen by different people. And, and you know, I've done, you know, uh, we, we lift, like, for example, uh, a couple months ago, we lifted a, uh, um, you know, a, a 1500 Sierra Denali and put some big tires on it. And I did a little, you know, 25 second commercial type of thing, you know, that, that added some humor to it. Um, you know, I said it's got a two inch lift like Zac Efron's running shoes, you know, the guy's 5'8". So, <laughs> uh, you know, poked a little fun there. And then, you know, that got seen by, you know, a couple thousand people that it normally wouldn't have. Right. And we had a ton of comments of, you know, Hey, what did you do to this truck? Can I see some, some other pictures of it from the side and that type of thing. So it, it's, uh, you know, it's definitely unique and, you know, there's, there's nothing, you know, when, especially if you're at a dealership, I don't think there's anything worse than, you know, if you have a, let's say a sales rep, um, who has a, you know, a, their sales account and all of their pictures are like the cars they've delivered. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's so boring. It looks like a yearbook you know, <laughs> photo of all the cars you've sold. Well, if I want to look at pictures of a, of a Kia Optima, I can do that on my own. You know, that's, yeah. you know, it's, it's keeping it, keeping it, you know, maybe a consistent theme with your branding, but also, um, you know, changing it up, you know, having a video of, of a walk around video, right? I've told some of my guys, you know, start, you got to get on this this video thing, this Instagram thing. Talk about you know the three cool you know features you might not know about this new pickup truck, you know, and post that video. Then that's that's getting people engaged where they're going, oh, I didn't know that, and that's a lot more interesting, especially with you know people's attention span now is probably worse than ever. I mean, yeah. I can't even oh. I can't even read a, a takeout menu, let alone a book now, <laughs> um, without having to start at the beginning. I got like a ruler underneath or like a bookmark line by line. I mean, it's awful. I've read better when I was in grade seven. Um, but it's, you know, it's, you know, the, those reels, the 25, 15, 30 seconds are perfect. And you can pack, if you, you know, do it properly, you can pack a lot of info into 30 seconds. I mean, a, a car commercial on, on the, on a TV, which is, you know, a dying form, let's be honest, right. is, 30, is 30 seconds. And they have so much BS. I mean, I've done videos of making fun of car commercials, you know, the guy driving through an empty city, like, who's that for? I've never seen empty streets in Toronto. It's, it takes me four hours to get across the city sometimes. <laughs> you know, I was like, why can't commercials be real? So, you know, having someone in the dealership who's, you know, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's me from this dealership and, and here's three things you didn't know about this Yukon. That to me is, is interesting content that'll have people reach out. It's not specifically sales focused because I think people have their guard up sure. when they see that type of thing. 
But if, if it's interesting enough, like I said, the video that I did on that Sierra that we lifted had nothing to do with the price, nothing to do with lease payments, but we had people reach out and go, that's a really cool truck. We sold it three days later. I have no idea if that had anything to do with me. I'd like to think so. But it was, you know, it got seen by a lot of people and people were asking us, you know, hey, can I see some, some other pictures of it? So it was creating that engagement with people that, you know, we normally wouldn't have. And if you had just posted a picture of that truck with lease payments on it, maybe, it wouldn't have gotten that type of engagement. Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, the, the thing that you just said right now that I think I, I want to emphasize here, again, for those folks that are that are kind of on the fence is that, um, you know, that content, when you do it in that manner, when you talk about sp specifics of that vehicle that's at your dealership and things of that nature, it's it can become more local. Not that it's going to be local as far as SEO purposes, but the content is for that specific unit that's at that specific dealership. And yeah. so people in the area that come across that content are more likely, you can impact those folks because the car is there. They, you know, if they like it and stuff, they can go see it, they can go test drive it. Um, and they might not even have said anything. They might not even reply to your comment or to your post, commented at all or anything like that, but they saw that car because of that piece of content. They're in the area, they're in market, and so they go to the dealership to go to check it out. So, yeah. um, to me, when I think about social media for our industry, for our, for our, and when I say industry, not the automotive industry, I'm talking more of the, of the vertical of retail automotive sales. To me, that's, that's more valuable. And I've said it on, on the show multiple times, but I rather post something that gets a hundred views and, and, you know, 10, 20 engagements from people that are local than something that's getting thousands upon thousands of views. Because the reality is, is that I, it, it serves you no purpose to, to have, you know, 3 million followers or whatever, because, you know, if your purpose is to sell cars, you're not going to do it that way. You know, it's more, exactly. it's more about the people that you can impact in your backyard. So the more 100%. your content is geared to the, towards that audience, the better the chances you are of, of, you know, um, selling that unit, moving that unit, you know, making that commission. So a hundred percent. And you know, like, a, um, you know, people who have Instagram, account, I mean, it, it happens, I see it all on my feed all the time. Someone gets a new car and it might not even be a new car. It's new to them. They purchased a pre-owned vehicle. Every person I know almost posts a picture of the new car they got. So, you know, and all their friends are, you know, it's probably the most interacted with picture that a regular person can post other than like a picture of an ultrasound or like their pregnant belly in a field or something, <laughs> right? I mean, people love, they're, so, they're happy for you. It shows, you know, maybe you're, you're, you're growing up finally or you're, you know, financially stable. People are really engaging with that post. So how valuable is that if you're on social media, the person you sold the car to posts it and tags you in the post, how many of those people are going to go look at your content now oh hey this person they bought this 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 uh this vehicle at humberview let me go check out the you know james's account oh wow he does a video on this i was actually i heard about that new mm. yukon that looks really cool oh it's got you know this these three features that's really cool and again that's just more engagement and that's that didn't cost you a dime that's just the customer being excited about their new car and because you're on social media and maybe mentioned it during the sales process at some point or maybe the delivery of hey you know if you're going to post a picture of you with your new car at the dealership, you know, how many people do that picture where they're right. holding up the keys, yeah, yeah. right? It's, you see it all over. Well, now you're tagged in that. And now you have this entire other account that you're reaching all of their followers too, right? Dude, I love that, that, that idea. I don't think I've ever looked at it in that way. I mean, I, I'm, I like when people post pictures of, of deliveries. I agree with you. Like if that's all that you're putting out there, then that's going to, that's going to get boring. But I do like to see that because because of that because um, if you tag the person that you sold the car to, then it can reach their their people, their network, or whatever. They're local, so they might. But the reverse of that is actually better. Now that I think about it, like if you get your yeah, customer to put a yeah. picture of their car and tag you in it, I, I think that that's that's kind of dope. I like that. Yeah, and then and then you can reshare that post, and now there's that other connection too, right? right? So I mean, I I think that's super. Super valuable. I mean, I, I unfortunately I kind of had that idea after I got out of actually selling cars myself. But there's a couple of my my team that do it, and I hope that that people at other dealers would do it too. Because you know, people people like likes. Okay, let's face sure, it. Sure. Yeah. Of course. Of course. When Instagram said they were removed, they were taking away showing how many likes. People freaked out, right? Yeah. So you know what gets more likes, and like I said, anything but probably a baby picture is a picture of you know your <laughs> new home or your new car. 
how many how many realtors are on Instagram now where they're you know it's the picture of the sold sign and you're tagging the person you bought the house from and then people are gonna check out your thing people are always looking for cars people are always looking for homes whether you can afford it or not I mean that's a different story Toronto's a disaster right now but you know that's that's that extra level of engagement that now you can reshare their posts and it's a two-way street yeah I like that so anybody you know especially people that are on the floor selling cars like you know, that's a great valuable tip right there. Definitely. I flip that and kind of uh, start monitoring that and see what you get. So um, I'm curious in your position, obviously you're posting content, content regularly, your folks see you doing it. Um, is it easier for them to do it themselves because of your example as, as, their, as their leader, boss, whatever? Um, or do you still see a lot of you know, shyness, resistance. No, I don't want to be on camera sort of a deal. I think it definitely helps. I mean, you know, there's, there's some people, again, you know, the guy who doesn't have a cell phone is not going to be the one who's all of a sudden out there with a selfie stick talking about mm. the cars. Right. But there's other ways to engage those people. Like, again, that same guy we have, we, we have a, you know, a company that, um, that comes in and, and does some of our video shooting for us and takes our pictures and they do a f absolutely phenomenal uh, job. And they, we asked him once, because again, he's not, he's not going to be the one who does it himself. He, it's just not going to happen. So we said, well, what, how about you get in one of these videos and you talk about, you know, a couple of things that you like about this truck. And he loved it. He freaked out. He was so excited to be in the video asking, when is it, you know, when's it going to be on YouTube? When am I going to be able to see it? Where can my kids see it? So that was, that was a super exciting thing because he saw me, uh, you know, doing the stuff that I was doing. And it's, it's, it goes back to the same thing as, you know, a lot of, uh, of managers say, and I've heard it and I really agree with it, is don't ask someone to do something you're not willing to do yourself, right? It's, it's the same thing as, you know, clearing off cars in the, in the snow. If you're, you know, which let's be honest, it does happen. Um, you know, you're sitting at the warm desk and you got the lock guys and the sales guys out there clearing off the cars. It goes a long way if you're out there as well, right? So if it's, you know, if we're, it's really hard to, ask your sales team to do something if you're not willing to do it yourself. Absolutely. No. And that's, that's, that's why I wanted to ask that question because typically when I've had people on the show, they're salespeople that have found a lot of success doing it. They don't even want to go into management because they're crushing it. Um, and they have the kind of their formula, but that benefits them as individuals. Right. Um, I love when I have uh, management um, and, you know, even like GMs and stuff that, that, that are doing it, like El Patron and Glenn Lundy when he was doing his thing, because I think that it trickles better. You know what I mean? Like that it just comes down better. It's a lot easier for everybody to get on board with that. Um, dude, it, 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 social media works, man. Like if you do it, if you're consistent and you, you, you follow a plan, like it does, you do get um, some benefits from it. So, for sure, yeah. Again, it's it's, and that's one thing that I really focused on. You know, when we were coming up with a plan for 2021. You know, I did a video on you know, my year in review about what it was like selling cars, and in 2020 was you know why do we really need these these big giant dealerships or you know empty basketball arenas full of cars in order to sell them, right? I mean, it's mostly online deal walk in traffic's at an all time low. You know, there's this. A, a, you know where I'm at right now. There's a stay-at-home order. You're not even supposed to leave your house unless you're going out for groceries or you know some sort of other essential type of of, of task. So, you know, getting online, doing videos, and I, that, that was one of the thing, the major things that I said for 2021 to you know the guys who are going to do it. Right? It might be the younger guys or the ones who are a little better with technology. It was you know instead of you know because you're not going to have as many face-to-face -face interactions you're not going to have the customer who's coming back three or four times for visits to the dealership because it's a massive inconvenience they're not even supposed to be on the road right now right. so why not you know after you maybe go back and forth with them a couple times and you've sort of built that relationship and you know maybe you have their email or their, or their cell phone number send them a 15 second video you know hey it's tyler from humberview uh thanks for you know inquiring on our website Here's the uh, the truck you were looking at. It's got 22 inch wheels, power running boards, and it's black on black. You know how much value is that building for when they do finally come in? They already know you. They might see you at your desk. Um, you know they already kind of have that that little relationship with you, or even taking it to the next step and doing actual live FaceTime or Zoom calls with a customer to do a virtual walk around. I mean, you know that's where the industry is going, and you know why not get on board with that right away? 
Do you think that that's going to stay, man? Do you think that regardless, I, we can't say post COVID yet, right? Especially, I mean, look at your guys' situation. Um, you know, like you're back in the kind of in the in the red zone sort of a deal, right? Um, but do you think once we get maybe it's maybe it'll take that the rest of this year to to kind of get to a place where okay, it's it's somewhat behind us. But do you yeah. think that the, those practices are going to stay? Like what you just talked about is it's it's pretty. It makes a lot of sense, and it, but it's very. Um, when you think about it, video is the quickest way to break the ice with the customer because the customer isn't at your place, right? They're 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 in a different location. Uh, you can call them and you can text them, but if they can see you, right? They can see your face. They can see your 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 facial expressions. Um, they're going to get a better impression of you, right? for better or worse, depending, you know, I don't know, depending on how, how, how you handle that whole deal. But I think that that's super, super valuable yet. We bear, we're barely doing it even now. Maybe, maybe you've seen, you've, you're seeing more so of that in your, uh, where you're from, but dude, I see, I consult with a lot of dealerships and it's like, it's so difficult. It's so difficult to get them to, to, to see the power of video. Yeah. I hope they do. I mean, you know, it's, it's so much, it's so much easier. You know, people don't, I think people are going to be so used to online shopping um, and stuff by the time this, you know, whether it's over or really over or the new norm or however you want to call it. I mean, we might be wearing masks for years, who knows, but um, you know, the, just the convenience of it, you know, this COVID forced us to be, you know, where we should have been 10 years ago, which was, you know, mostly online with the ability to send videos to customers and, and pictures. I mean, why are we still, you know, why, why are we still running newspaper ads? You know, let's move to to Instagram, to TikTok, where people are actually seeing it. Um, and, you know, I mean, obviously, there's some some things that I hope don't stay like, you know, I have to sit behind a plastic shield at my desk and trying to communicate with someone when you're both wearing masks and there's a plastic shield in between you. I mean, it's literally impossible. But, <laughs> uh, um, you know, I hope I hope that, the, you know, the convenience stuff does does stay. You know, hey, hey, here's a 30 second walk around video of, of the, the vehicle you were you were interested in online. You know, I don't think people are going to want to come in and spend, you know, four or five hours at a dealership. I mean, people hate hated that before this. Right. But but then the question is, right. Um, if we're all doing it and it becomes the norm, then how do you what do you do to stand out? You know what I mean? Exactly. I guess what's that, what's that next level of, of differentiation? You know, it could be, um, you know, bringing a, bringing a vehicle to someone's house for a, for a test drive. So they don't ever have to come to the store. Uh, you know, there, there's probably a different, I mean, there's things that probably I, my, I can't even think of right now that, you know, in two, three years from now might be the, the that the version of what we're doing now. Right. I don't know, man. I, 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 I'm super excited for that part because I think that, um, I don't agree with a lot of this, and you, you you alluded to it in the beginning. Like you said, if I if I hear the yeah, for what did you say? Like forever change or whatever, like um, oh, yeah. uh, unprecedented times. Oh, unprecedented times. <laughs> yeah, if I hear that phrase again, I'm gonna smash my head through a fish tank. <laughs> yeah, mine is uh, the industry has forever changed. Like no. I don't, I don't, I just don't subscribe to that. What I do think is that we are more um create we're, we're not that we are more creative but we're forced to be more creative now and i think two to three years of all that stuff's really going to start to 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 show because we're all pretty much forced to do business differently right with digital retailing and offering online uh alternatives 100%. to to sales and service not just once you know it's for the for the whole operation and so what that's going to do is going to force a lot of people to really start to get creative on ways to stand out. What, the, to your point, what that looks like, I don't know. I don't, you know, like that's, that's yet to be determined, but I think that, 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 you know, I like where, where we are in that regard. I think that's going to be super cool to see. And, and it, it poses a question for me. And that is how do you think that dealerships are doing or have done uh, when it comes to creating brands, for example, or differentiators, because it's, it doesn't seem like that's been, it, it really feels like the same recycled experience to a certain degree from dealership to dealership. Yeah. I mean, again, and, and that's sort of what, what I said in the beginning is that, you know, this sort of 
antiquated um, industry in in a lot of ways. You know, people are still you still get money from OEMs for doing uh, radio ads and print ads. You know, I mean, I mean, your return on investment on that. I mean, I'm not a, a you know a genius. It does it, it can't it can't be great. Why are you using Why aren't you using you know the modern um, platforms and that type of thing? It's it, you know, there's, and again, I still can't believe that there's dealerships who have stock photos on their website for their inventory. Yeah. You know, that, that absolutely blows me away when I see dealerships that, you know, occasionally there's going to, there's going to be that maybe it's a new piece and you haven't had a chance to get it photographed yet. But you know, at our store, everything is from the day it lands to when it's online is less than 36 hours. So, you know, people are visual, people are visual creatures. You know, that you, there's no, when you go on Tinder or any of these other disaster dating apps that thankfully I'm not on, it, it's pictures of people, right? It's not stock <laughs> photos of, of this age person and this, you know, background person. It's, you know, there's actual pictures of them. Why, why should, why would a car be any That's different? That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> you know, like, oh, this, this person's 25 this and he hockey. It's my Here's stock, stock photos. <laughs> You know, like what, that's what are you doing? Why wouldn't you? You're buying a car that's as you know, as everyone says, it's almost a cliche statement. It's the second biggest purchase in your life. Why wouldn't you pay the extra little bit of money as a dealership to have 25, 30 photos of that car online? You know, cars are are becoming a lot more unique now. There's, mm -hmm. you know, you're seeing it across all brands. There's, I mean, I'm, you know, younger than a lot of my team, so I'm a little biased towards it. I love the, you know, blacked out midnight edition, whatever, you know, black edition, elevation edition, whatever brands are calling them, they all have them now where it's that fully blacked out look. The car's got black rims, black <laughs> emblems, black grill. I mean, everything on the car is black. You tint it out, the thing disappears at night, right? I love that look, <laughs> right? So if you're a young person who's looking for that, that stock photo, the stock photo is not going to have those things on it. You want to see those black rims. You want to right, see, yeah. you know, like that, that lifted truck we did. I keep talking about that Sierra. You, you're going to want to see the big knobby off-road tires on it and the leveling kit that we put on it. You know, that's to me is the most basic way to differentiate yourself as far as a customer experience goes. They're actually seeing 25 pictures of that truck. So, um, that's what we're looking at. Funny story to that. So I bought a, uh, a 4Runner. No, I took it to I, I I drove it from the dealership to my to my girlfriend's house and I just parked it and she comes outside. I didn't tell her anything. She comes outside and she looks at it and she's like, Oh, you, you got a you brought a car from the dealer. And I was like, I actually bought it. And she looked at it, she's like, Really? You bought that car? It's, it's like a mom car. <laughs> like, no, no, but you haven't seen the full. Like it's it's gonna get better. So I, I you know, I had ordered rims and a rack and I did the the black um you know I, I covered up the, the chrome logos with a black on black so you know yeah. I had a vision of where this thing was going. <laughs> exactly. Jeez, so I, like, yeah. She was like you know, I can't see you that you look like a like a mom. It's not a mom car. Yeah. yeah. You know it's and, and just like you did that there's dealers that are starting to do that as well. There's companies that are you know customizing trucks and customizing cars for people. Those vehicles themselves are unique and you're spending a lot of money to make those cars unique. Why wouldn't you want to show them off? Yeah. The stock photo is not going to have the lift kit, the big tires, the exhaust, the tinted windows, and the decals on it, right? Like, right. yeah, to no, me, it's the basic it, it, way to do it. And it changes the car, dude. Like it does. Like to to that point when I when I did all those mods to it and I brought it back, it was like, oh, okay. And she was like, I get it now. But um, you don't see, you know, you don't with a stock photo, you're not going to get that. So, hundred percent, yeah. Maybe we should, dude. That's what we got to do. We got to invent something like an app that you put your car in there and it like tricks it up. You know what I mean? And then you, yeah, you can actually pick, but not with stock photo, with the actual inventory photo. Right. You can pick different rims. You can tint the windows. Who? Why didn't someone come up with that yet? Yeah, I know. Quick. Like, what, you guys are talking about? Like, goes oh. up. Trade market. Yeah. Um. So, what do you think is the? You know, obviously. You know, I, I hate talking about like COVID and all that because I feel like I, I, that's all we've been talking about this season. But um, and I know for good reason, right? There's there's a lot there. But um, what do you feel like? Uh, you know, is the is the the next thing for us in the space, right? I mean, things are changing. We, I get that, but I mean, do you foresee it? Um, 
do you do you foresee the social media thing like taking on? Do you foresee like all dealerships at some point here in the in, in the next couple of years? Everybody's like full on board with social media and and really you know uh, doing this deal or uh, do you think that we're still going to have some resistance? Like how do you how do you foresee all that playing out? I mean, I'd I'd like to be naive enough to believe that everyone's <laughs> going to be on board with it. I just, I don't, I don't think it's, you know, we've already seen it during, during this. I mean, there were, there were dealerships. I don't know what it's like where, where you're at, but there were dealerships in our area who, when the shutdown first happened, um, even though it wasn't government mandated, they closed their doors. There was no adaptation of like, Hey, let's challenge ourselves and see how we can do this remotely and online. You know, we, you know, we still, we sold probably 35% of what a normal month would be, I think in March or April when the, when the shutdown happened, I think it was April. Um, so we, you know, a little less than half of what we normally sell, but there were dealerships that sold no cars. You know, we, wow. we did, we were one of the ones who were like, look, we're not going to shut down more than we have to. Obviously there were, you know, extreme regulations. Our sales team were working 100% from home. Management was in, you know, every other day doing the deliveries and stuff, which was kind of interesting. Put me back to my roots, uh, you know, <laughs> going over all the paperwork and stuff. Um, but there were dealerships like that completely shut down. And it was like, okay, well, I, you know, for a week or two, that's fine. But what are you going to do? This is not a short term thing. And we've seen that. It's almost been a year now. Yeah. Right. I think that there are going to be ones who are resistant to it, thinking that it might go back or hoping that it might go back to what it was, you know, end of 2019, which I don't see that happening anytime soon. I think they're going to die out. There's already dealerships that are, you know, struggling massively um, to, to make ends meet because they're not adapting or, you know, whether it's a refusal to adapt or maybe they have a, uh, you know, a sales team that's, that's reluctant to do this. It's, you know, the ones who are, who are, who are trying to, to think ahead that are not going to get, you know, blockbustered, let's put it that way, <laughs> you know, let's try to be the Netflix, like you know, that. Netflix, they, most people now probably don't even know that Netflix, you, I mean, what was it? They mailed DVDs to your house. Yeah. Yeah, man. Back in the day. Like, that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. yeah. You know, 15 years maybe. And now everyone has a netflix account you know some people are maybe stealing from their friends and using their password which is why i have to change my password every six months but you know they adapted to the online thing it's i watch more netflix on my phone now than i do on a on a computer or, or tv well to that point and i've had this conversation here before and it got pretty heated <laughs> um but do you think that the industry has been disrupted? Like there's there's people claiming disruption. Oh, the industry has been uh, to me, dude, like there's no disruption. There's been some some enhancements to it, maybe. There's been some some uh technological growth, but disruption, I don't we're still buying cars the same way we used to, we used to Yeah, buy cars. you know, a disruption would be like if what's the company where you can basically buy a car out of a vending machine? Carvana or Carvana, like Carvana, yeah. Carvana. A disruption would be they're selling 80% of cars now. Yes, exactly. That that would be a disruption, right? Like you said, it's not, have we been disrupted? Yes, but I don't think it's the traditional disruption. Like, you know, when, when Uber took over and people, you know, stopped taking cabs, that's a disruption. Right. You know, like, like you said, I do agree with you. I, until you said that, I may have actually disagreed, but it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, we've had to adapt to this. And like I said, this forced us to be where we should have been in 2010. And that's, 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 that's the point of the question, right? Like we, um, we're not in that place where, where we're, I, how do I say this? Like we're still ahead, right? We're still leading this, this, the, the, this vertical of, of the automotive space. And it's up to us to keep that, that, that lead, you know what I mean? So, um, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like, that's the point, right? Like we we're, we're still in control of this deal. We gotta, we, we gotta start looking at things differently because otherwise we can be in a, in a pretty weird situation. Like I, I had uh, Max Dean on yeah. the show and he said something that I think about often, man. He was like, what happens if you wake up tomorrow and you find out that Amazon bought Carvana or brought, bought Vroom or some of these, some of these com that dude, that's, that's a scary thought, man, for me, you know? So, yeah. It's, you know, I, I think it definitely accelerated 
the, you know, inevitability of that happening. I think, you know, two years ago, you're like, oh, fuck. 15 20 years down the road maybe you won't need a dealership right and now it's like maybe five you know five seven you know it maybe even less than that i think people have seen you know oh shit, this is getting a little bit crazier than than we may have thought so i think you again it's not really a, dis a disruptor in the traditional sense maybe it's you know you have to sort of take these baby steps now so that when it does happen you're ready right yes it's not you know you don't want to still be the be the dealership that's doing newspaper ads when Amazon buys Carvana and you're going, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, but we still have the newspaper people. <laughs> okay, well, have fun selling twelve cars a year, dude. Because the last time I saw someone delivering newspapers was like two thousand and four. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. All right, dude. So we're getting close to that time, but I did want to talk. I, I wanted to give you some time to talk about some of your projects. In particular, I wanted to ask you about the podcast, man. I'm super stoked. I I I, I caught the first episode. I haven't been able to tune in um, since, but the, I love that first episode with the flying cars and all that, dude. That was that was <laughs> super dope. Yeah. So um, tell us about that project, man. Yeah. So like I said, you know, the goal kind of, and the reason the whole thing's named Heated Seats is that I wanted to turn it into a podcast eventually. Um, I just wasn't sure how to do that. So I started with the, um, you know, the, the short form videos and then, you know, making some, you know, memes and stuff. I have a very memeable face, I guess. I don't know. My face is very elastic, like Jim Carrey. People say I look like Nick Cage. Nick Cage, man. Right dude, I'm getting that so much Nick lately. Nick Cage, for really sure, crazy. dude. <laughs> so, you know, and the goal is always to have a, to have a, a podcast with it. So, you know. Sean Anthony is actually a major reason I like to give him a shout out if I could. Um, uh, you know, an awesome guy that reached out to me on LinkedIn when I started posting these videos and said, you know, do you ever want to do a podcast? I can help you. And I literally I couldn't have done it without him. So just a quick shout out to Sean Anthony, if you don't mind. But um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's, I'm trying to keep them short for now. You know, it's, you know, I, I'm someone who, you know, I, I love listening to a, you know, hour and a half, two and a half hour long podcast is, you know, with some comedians maybe, but realistically that's, you need to have a massive following for that to be digestible, right? You know, sure. like like the, like the Joe Rogans of the world type right, of thing, yeah. right? So I thought, you know, why don't I, you know, people seem to like the rants that I do in my videos, which it's funny because I, uh, the videos I do are, you know, between two and four minutes long and I script them out, I write them and every word is super important to making it funny and interesting. I try to find that balance between being, um, you know, informative and being funny. I don't want it to be too silly, and I don't want it to be, you know, boring, too boring and informative. So I try to ride that fine line. And the podcast is almost the opposite. It's the same brain, <laughs> but it's like an opposite method of doing it. I literally, like, for the first episode, for example, I had three bullet points written down, and I talked for like 15 minutes. I just start rambling. My brain starts going. I think about this. Oh, I'm on this thing. Oh, I'm talking about blimps now. I think maybe the first episode I started talking about how stupid blimps are. So, you know, for the most part, the episodes are going to be between 10 and 15 minutes long. Um, there's four episodes currently up right now. You can find it on uh, iTunes, YouTube. I put the audio up as well. Um, Spotify and Google Podcasts. Get it well, on, uh, put it on Amazon, Amazon Music, so we can Alexa it. Oh, that'd be good. Imagine, imagine that you're trying to cook and you hear me rambling in the background. Yeah, you can say, Alexa. Dude, it's kind of cool because you can be like, Alexa, play heated seats and it starts yeah. playing your podcast. It's kind of dope. And then you hear me just <laughs> rambling about nonsense. But yeah, you know, I like to keep it short, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. I think that's a very digestible amount for, for now for what I'm doing to get, you know, a little bit of a, of a following and, and some interest in it. You know, it's something you can listen to while working out on your drive to work. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's really quick. It's in and out. I just actually recorded this past week in my first um, longer episode. It was almost 45 minutes uh, with some guests. It was my first podcast with guests that I actually did video for as well. So um, I love learning new stuff and having to edit that and put the video together is something that's going to take me a little bit, but that episode should be up early February. But yeah, I'm really enjoying it. You know, I'm trying to do about two podcasts a month. Um, you know, I'll come up with some ideas that I want to, you know, sort of ramble about and that type of thing. And I just sort of go off from there and, and I hope it's funny and I hope it's interesting. And I'm, you know, I just, this morning I hit, uh, uh, or yesterday morning I hit like 300 downloads, uh, to all time total downloads on, on the four episodes, which um, no, I think it's, it's 
sounds pretty good to me. I mean, that means people are listening and I've gotten some great feedback on it so far. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty cool. I, I got to catch up. I haven't really been been able to listen to any podcast. I listen to a bunch of them. I have, uh, you know, I'm on, I'm on the road a lot, so it's, it's good for that, for that reason. But yeah, I love the first episode. I'm excited to listen to the other ones. Thanks, man. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's all the same stuff. Like, like I said, it's, it's, it's quick and it's, it's easy, digestible. And that's why I make my videos two to four minutes as well. And that's why I've started doing a lot more of these reels that are 15 to 30 seconds. I'm trying to master the three, you know, lengths of, uh, of content, the 30 second, the four minute and the 15 minute, right? So it's, you know, they're easy to, to, to digest. You can put it on quickly. It's, you know, 12 and a half minutes. It's, it's, and it doesn't even feel that long. I've had people reach out and be like, you know, I actually want it to be longer. So it'll eventually get there, but I'm new to it and I'm having a lot of fun with it. Hopefully going to have some more guests and, and do video and that type of thing when, when you're allowed to have, you know, be on the road and it's not illegal. <laughs> <laughs> right on, man. So there is one question I ask everybody that comes on the show. Before I do that, I want to give you a chance to tell everybody how they can connect with you. We're going to put everything in the show notes as well. So if you're watching this or if you're listening to this on the on the app, on, on the podcast app, go to the show notes and their information will be there. If you're watching it on my YouTube channel, then go to the video description and we're going to link everything there. But so how can we connect with you, man? Yeah, so Instagram is uh, at heated underscore seats. That's where uh, I post the most content. So it has full um, links to the podcast, the full episodes on my IGTV, as well as all the reels I'm doing, the roast my ride thing that kind of blew up a little bit yeah. um, as well. YouTube.com slash heated seats with Tyler Champagne. And then again, podcast is on Spotify, Google, and iTunes, heated seats, the podcast. And uh, yeah, give it a listen if, if you are into that, you know, 12 to 15 minute episodes, pretty quick, pretty funny, I think um, you're in and out. Right on, man. So um, there is one question that I ask everybody that comes on the show. And that question is, where do you see the automotive industry headed in the next five years and why? Yeah, well, I mean, we, we touched on a lot of this stuff, right? It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited for it. I love this industry um, and I, I'm happy to call it a career and I'm excited to see where it's, where, it's, um, where it's going. You know, I've only been in the industry for six years, but I'm excited to see that, you know, I want to look out on my lot and see, you know, for my sales guys taking videos of cars. You know, I want that to be the norm. I want people to be posting stuff on, on TikTok. You know, I'm a little more biased towards the comedy side of things, but that's not for everybody, right? That's what, you know, I consider myself good at. That's what works for me. But there's people, you know, like uh, I'm sure you've had him on, um, Jeff Hunter um, yep. is probably the best product guy out there, at least for General Motors. I mean, his name is General Motors Jeff. So yep. I don't know if he nicked it or his mom did. <laughs> I mean, if his mom named him that when he came out of the womb, I mean, he really didn't have another career choice, but, um, you know, he's great at product stuff and that's his niche and he absolutely kills it. You know, I, I order all the inventory for our, my dealership and I can still find stuff from his, his videos that I learned. So I want that to be the norm. I want people to be on, you know, on TikTok, on, on Instagram, um, you know, doing, you know, why wouldn't you have a, a sales podcast? Who, why not? It's, you know, it's so easy to, to have all these things now. You, you can have a channel, a YouTube channel that has the same bandwidth that like CBS did 20 years ago, right? You can go live with a certain number of followers and all this stuff too. So I want to see people turn towards that. I want to see, you know, dealerships promoting or, and helping their, their people get there. Um, you know, an interesting dealership account. You know, I've seen it so many times where you know you find a dealership on Instagram and their last post is from June of 2017. You know, that that type of attitude, that lackadaisical nonsense is not gonna get you anywhere moving forward. I wanna see social media, um, you know, pictures of your cars online, making it unique, making the sales experience unique and, you know, move away from radio ads and newspaper ads. I know I've mentioned that a few times, but that stuff drives me nuts. I mean, um, you know, when I, whenever I go to my mailbox and there's a stack of stuff in there, I, you know, filter through the, you know, the red envelopes that say, hey, this is past due. Um, I hold <laughs> on to those and I throw the rest in the trash. You know, it's not, that's such an old way of doing things. But if I see a video scrolling through my feed of a cool vehicle or, or something that says, you know, three things you didn't know about the, uh, the Honda Civic Type R, 
I might watch that for 15 seconds, right? I'm, I'm on my phone way too much as it is. Just ask my girlfriend. But, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, you know, we're on our phone so much and all this stuff. I want to see it go, um, you know, as digital as possible. I think, this, you know, the test drive experience and, and having the dealerships is still going to be around for a bit. I hope I work in one. But uh, I just wanted to, to be a little more, uh, a little advanced. You know, like I said, we should have been where we're at now in 2010. So let's take that one step further. Let's get our people on social media, brand yourself, um, and let's sell some more cars with it. Right on, man. I love, 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 love that answer. That's 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 right on point. All right. Well, dude, thank you so much. Tyler Champagne, everybody, on the program. Um, really appreciate you doing this, dude. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for tuning in. And as usual, we'll talk later. We only host the well respected. The vendor Lexus Nexus. We don't sell digital marketing. What you do? We inspect it with our DT vendor management solutions. We come in like the EPA to clear out the pollution. Take the trash. Go keep your PL clean. Your inventory lean. You From product pitches, meetings to cost negotiations, your vendors have you swamped. You have cars to sell, but most of your time goes in managing your vendor relationships. Wouldn't it help to have someone navigate the way ahead? Enter Dealer Talk Vendor Management Solutions. A filter between you and your vendor so you only have to deal with what's most important. We inspect your digital data to get optimum results for your money. Here's what we do give you an accurate idea of what's working and what's not for every digital service. Get vendors to submit monthly highlights, lowlights, and recommendations. Sift through their data to give you those metrics that matter. Evaluate all package, content, or cost changes and product pitches. Do monthly marketing budget analysis to ensure better ROIs. Finally, we give you concise reports and monthly videos with actionable insights. Now, you can focus on what really matters, selling cars. Contact us today and your first 30 days are free. Let's build your business together.